Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Welcome to our YIS Global Online Club meeting this week. Uh, we're going to be going over Unit 3, Lesson 3, What Makes a Good Business. I have with me today one of our student advisory board members, Alan from Texas. He's going to be your instructor today. Um, we also are going to have a guest speaker uh, midway through our club meeting. Uh, Laura Garrett is going to be joining us. She's the CEO um, from Rondure Capital, and she's going to be leading a discussion today on what makes a good business. So that should be super exciting. So Alan, whenever you're ready, I'll give it up to you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. It's uh, super exciting. This is my... Uh first meeting. I usually work Monday through Thursday, like clockwork. So let me, uh, cool. Uh, so a little icebreaker that I wanted to start with was actually Tesla. They recently joined the S&P 500, which skyrocketed their growing stock. Uh, Tesla stock. And then another big news that came out was actually the COVID testing that, uh, mm, Moderno, Moderno, I think, process because of that, their stock also increased, but other stocks like airlines and for me, Carnival Cruises also increased, which was crazy how one thing impacts the entire market here in Tesla this week. You can kind of see where it joined the S&P 500 and then that, that big skyrocket right there. So let's get started with the lesson. Alrighty, so this lesson's gonna be what makes a good business and why we should invest in them. And the main thing that we're gonna take away from this lesson is ROE. Is ROE, which is return on equity. And ROE really ties into moats. Again, ROE. What makes a great business? What makes a business a dud? Again, two of the most important questions for any long-term investor and ones that we will answer during this next unit. Let me start with a personal example. One day, as an investment analyst, I walked into my boss's office and I said, what do you think about this company? It was a smartphone company based in Taiwan called HTC. I said, look at these numbers. The company is growing. They have great margins. Their cash flow is great each year. And a lot of other investors like them too. Plus, the stock price right now looks really cheap on a PE basis, trading at below 10 times PE. My boss said, okay, these numbers look good. But have you looked at the history of Motorola, Blackberry, Palm, and Nokia? Why would HTC be any different? for one egg that had failed miserably. Thankfully, we didn't invest in HTC. The value of the company has dropped by more than 90% since that day as the company's business has floundered. But isn't Apple the largest seller of smartphones in the world and one of the most valuable companies in the world? What makes Apple different than HTC and the rest of the failed smartphone manufacturers? Why did Starbucks succeed while Circuit City went bankrupt? Why is Google such a powerful company while Kodak went belly up? What makes companies like Coca-Cola and Walmart so powerful decade after decade after decade? What you'll notice is that great businesses are ones that stand the test of time. They have what investors like to call an economic moat, which makes it very difficult for others to copy their advantage. They each have a secret sauce. In this unit, we're going to identify the common types of economic moats, the different types of secret sauces that great companies look for. You'll learn the economic moats of brands, network effects, high switching costs, and low cost advantages. Once you know exactly what to look for, it will be much easier for you to identify great businesses to invest in and to avoid the duds. As Steve Jobs used to say, one more thing. The people who identified companies like Apple and Netflix and Starbucks and IBM, that they had a secret sauce and they bought their stock early on are millionaires and billionaires by now. We hope that you take the lessons we are gonna teach you in this unit 
of how to identify economic moats of great businesses. And in doing so, you'll become the next generation of legendary investors. Hey, Alan, I can't hear you for some reason. Is that better? Can y'all hear me now? Yeah, thank uh, I'm you. I'm so sorry, so sorry. Uh, so we're going to see why businesses do so good and then eventually fall and why they fall. So why do y'all think some businesses succeed and why some fail? All righty, cool. So in my opinion, a lot of businesses uh, succeed and fail. Uh, when I look at it, I see are they trends? And if it is trends, that I usually don't stick with them. And again, how you can identify those companies that are just trends compared to the ones that are gonna stand out for a lot while. So we're gonna move over to handout 3.1, which is, I have it here. 3.1 was the previous lesson though. Yeah, it was. Alrighty. So we're going to go ahead and skip handout 3.1. So, and here we're going to see why competition is kind of bad. So for a candy shop, the people have a choice to go to whichever candy shop they want. And usually candy kind of varies a little, but not too much where everybody can say, hey, we're going to this specific thing. And because of that, high competition, they have to lower prices so they can compete with each other. That means more money for advertisement to get their word out. And then on average, that means their earnings at the end is so low because of all this spending versus losing money to competition, all the lower prices there are, and the more advertising. So all the businesses, when they first start up, they're small, they're always going to have competition. But once they establish themselves in their region, that's what makes them so powerful. And then again, all businesses usually go through this. And that, that thing that sets them apart was already taught in lesson, uh, in lesson two of chapter three. And it is again, the economic moat. My bad. So the, so these companies have that big mo. Everybody knows Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola themselves own so many other brands that it doesn't really matter. Walmart, everybody knows Walmart. And that's why they provide high returns and they can protect themselves from everybody else because there's not a lot of people that can compete with Walmart or Coca-Cola or I don't really know much about Colgate, but it's there. And again, you know, the main takeaway from the entire uh, entire chapter of three is economic moats. For the next meeting, you're gonna go through there, but there's also a Kahoot that we can play if y'all wanna log in.
again, return on equity, that big thing about equity is that they care about how much money is getting brought out. that company should be in the future. I've been saying the main takeaway about chapter three is economic moat. That's what makes any company take it to the next level, make it su successful, and it's going to uh, pass the test of time. companies apple and harlot packard harlot packard is hp usually the uh, computer company they also sell software but apple computers phones software apps and retail stores who do y'all think is gonna make more money at the end of that segment from 1995 to 2004 apple of course and yeah you're right it is apple because of their moat how uh, easily they can separate themselves. Everybody knows Apple, not, and with HP, there's also many more competitors, Alienware, that can go against it. Apple just really just has happened some that goes against them. But even then, it's different OS, and they have different other ways to make money. And from here, you can see Apple increased from 13% to 30% on their return of equity, which compared to HP, they actually dropped about 2%. And again, more portability. That's why they benefit so much. And again, like lesson two was, uh, yeah, lesson two from chapter three was talking about that economic moat is what makes them such a strong brand and high switching costs because of uh, the ecosystem you're in from uh, the Apple Watch to iPhone to everything that suits you in. And because of that, the, uh, the stock value increased almost a thousand percent and then HP only increased 40% because, again, they did have a decent enough ROE. It just wasn't anything near where Apple was. And that's the effect that you can have by finding those companies that really solidify you. So we're going to move on to the actual activity. And this is why I have a crazy amount of tabs pulled up. So in 2005, aliens invited, invaded the planet. <laughs> I'm sorry. And they're going to this, destroy the human world. But they want to show the people that know who can get the higher return over the next decade for those companies. And if you can't, you die. So we're going to compare two companies at a time and we're going to see who we think will be successful over the 10 years and who can get that high ROE over the following 10 years. Your life depends on it. All righty, let's go. Let's get started. And while we're looking at these, we're going to make sure we're going to be thinking of economic moats. What are they selling to make people increase demand or decrease it? What makes them so much better than each other? And again, the economic mode that solidifies it in everybody's opinion. So we have Walt Disney with an ROE of 12.6% and then Nintendo from ROE of 15% from 1995 to 2004. Um, I'll just go ahead and run through this one to see how it goes. So Walt Disney has theme parks, they make movies, they sell merchandise, they own ESPN and Disney Channel. I think they own a few more channels now, you know, looking into the future. And Nintendo makes video game systems, video games, including that's their own ecosystem. 
So uh, who do y'all think could retain that ROE and why? Um, probably Walt Disney because they do have the, that secret spice being that they do everything based on like, you know, policing their families and stuff like that. Nintendo, even though they're a console company, they do have a much smaller audience. And so there's been uh, some new consoles that have become irrelevant as well. So I believe about this thing is definitely yeah. going to increase. Yeah, for sure. And you're exactly right. Nintendo itself is its own little ecosystem. And if you're not part of it, not a lot of people buy into it. And with Walt Disney, they've increased so much. Everybody knows the Disney logo. We all love their movies. And again, they own so many things that can make them flow. Even if something's bad, then it, it doesn't really matter at the end. And yeah, of course, y'all are right. And we can look at the Nintendo stock right here. I'll pull up Walmart instead of, but we can see about here in 2015 stuff. Oh, wait, oopsies. All right, so 2005 is going to be about here. This is where they had a new release. And then we're looking at 2004. We're looking from 1995 to 2004. So it's about, is it 1995 to 2004? Yeah, okay, I was right, I apologize. So we're looking from about here to here, and there was no large increase, that's after a console, but because of it, the actual stock price is low, so we know that ROE isn't that high at all. So if we go to Disney, Disney stock. Max out. So here's about 1995, and then we see a subtle increase, and then we see a subtle increase, and then here's 2004. Now both of them, this uh, stock actually dropped. Uh, I have to Google its actual ROE to find it, but Disney itself keeps growing and growing. And here we see Nintendo how their cycle goes through consoles, drops, consoles, drops, consoles, drops. So the ROE in general isn't going to be good enough because it's based on a cycle where Disney just keeps increasing and flowing. Alrighty, next question. So we have Abercrombie and Fitch versus Coca-Cola. Abercrombie and Fitch with an ROE of 55%, but Coca-Cola has 17.9%. Background, it's a clothing company. It's kind of like a Hollister and American Eagle. Coca-Cola, there's, I mean, self-explanatory. Who do y'all think is going to be able to retain it from 2005 to 2014? Um, definitely Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't know about y'all, but Aerocombi and Fitch kind of turned a little less relevant. You know, not a lot of people know about it anymore. Coca-Cola, it owns a crazy amount of uh, beverage companies and even water is always increasing. It always has that steady increase and it's not going to go anywhere. And you can, e even by just looking at the chart itself, it's always steadily increasing, making a high ROE. And you see Aerocombi, we see again that cycle, which makes it really bad. And right here, you can kind of see where people really stop caring for the brand and it keeps dropping and dropping. So actually, you're probably going to be at a loss for the ROE. It's not going to look good. So next one is Southwest Airlines versus McDonald's. From here, we're going to look uh, 2005 to 2014, 2005 to 2014. Southwest Airlines, kind of self-explanatory. Uh, it's an airline and McDonald's, again, self-explanatory. Who do y'all think is going to be better? And McDonald's, yeah. Airlines tend to fluctuate. And especially right now with uh, COVID, most of them are down. Uh, I personally have money invested in Carnival Cruises that also kind of spiked, but it is what it is. And with McDonald's, everybody knows that it. it's always a growing brand. There's there are always room for expansion to different countries, and we can see it right here. 2005 to 2014, there's a spike surprisingly, but right here we can kind of see the effects of COVID, and they're coming back up because again. The Moderna vaccine that came out 90% efficiency a couple of days ago, that really spiked it up. 
uh, spiked up my Carnival Cruises too. And then we can see McDonald's. So you can always see that steady increase, that always steady increase. And that's what you really want to see when you're long-term investing, especially with that ROE always increasing. So again, McDonald's is where you want to go because most of these companies that we've been looking at is their opponent usually runs in a cycle. So it always has its ups and downs and ups and downs. And that's not what you want when you invest. What you really want is something that you can just sustain for the long run, look at it, maybe it's peak at it a couple of years, but it's always going to increase. Cycles are just, that's not how you make money. It's just going to increase, decrease, increase. There's no way to profit off of it. This last question is going to be Microsoft versus Verizon. This one was kind of iffy for me. I wasn't too sure. Microsoft, they make Windows. They also make the Xbox. They make a couple of other things. Verizon is, I mean, Verizon, a phone company. Who do y'all think is going to be the better ROE? I mean, I still think Microsoft could take the lead, but that's because they're always, they always get like new modes over time. So like recently they did stick with like Microsoft Teams as well. And Verizon's always been kind of the same thing as well. So they're very specific with their audience. So I think Microsoft, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I kind of agree with you on this one too. Microsoft always has room for improvement, it's always growing. Uh, would they have different variations if their computer software doesn't wear, uh, work? There's always uh, their consoles. There's always other things that really help them out compared to Verizon, where, like you said, they kind of have their their ecosystem already set with their customer bases. We're looking at customer loyalty. The only thing that they can do is uh, improve how they're doing 5G, fiber optics, but there's so much competition because everybody else really has that compared to Microsoft, let's say for the Xbox, they're mostly competing with um, PlayStation, maybe Nintendo sometimes. With Windows itself, you have other smaller programs. So our main competitor is probably going to be the, uh, the Mac OS. But again, we can see more of that increase. And you can kind of see that increase right there, that 25.2%. They're both kind of the same. Honestly, for me, this question was the trickiest one out of both of them. Um, Microsoft, you can always see that increase, that curve, that it, there, it's always steadily increasing, which is really what you want to see with Verizon. Uh, it does increase here, but again, you know, personal opinion, uh, I didn't really like it because it's, it's kind of really iffy. Again, phone networks, we don't know how long we're going to go with them. Microsoft, it always has that moat that did so many other things that really establishes them. So yeah, good job, guys. That was uh, less than 3.3 that I really wanted to go over. Again, the main thing that you want to get out of this lesson is two things. Uh, with me, I usually see their history to see what they're increasing, but more so importantly, their moat. So if I can't say, oh, that's that company that makes this, or they do this, or they have this, you know, uh, with Nike, it's, you know, they're just, they're, they're little flake. It's, those things that make really help make a brand stand out and that you're going to know that it's most likely going to be successful in the future, that we don't see things that can just cycle through that are just fads. Like when it was like the fidget spinner thing, that they're not going to be successful companies. That's um, especially with pharmaceuticals, they increase and decrease and increase depending on how their vaccines and their medicines go. But that's not really what you want for long term. Long term, you're always going to look at ROE and you're going to look at modes. And that's the main thing about chapter three that you're going to see to make a really good company stand out and make you, hopefully, a bunch of money. Um, Thanks so much, Alan. That was that was great. Um, I want to thank you. Thank everyone for joining us. Um, we have our guest speaker who also has joined us, Laura Garrett. Uh, CEO for Global Rondeur uh, is here with us, um, and I'm going to go ahead and give it away to her. So, Alan, if you wanted to stop sharing your screen. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Great, because Hi, I'm going to be... Hi, how are you? Hi. You know me, I'm tech, not very tech savvy, so, you know, my Zoom screen skills are, are weak, but I will say Alan could have basically... I mean, our process is Alan's process. <laughs> That is exactly how Roger looks at stocks. Just 
for you guys' knowledge, I'm 20. Uh, I, I'm a 22 year industry veteran. I started in the industry prior to the tech bubble. So I watched the tech bubble blow in the United States. Um, and I've been doing emerging markets and international and frontier markets for years and years and years. We look for two things, uh, I guess a couple of things. We do proprietary screening for quality. So there are certain factors in, in terms of quality that I think maybe I can almost answer every single one of the questions on the stocks that Alan went through from experience of covering them. But um, we look at first and foremost, balance sheet quality and cash flow stability in terms of thinking about is the company special and we screen bottom up and we do it for every company in the world. And there's approximately 70,000 of those from small cap emerging and frontier to Terra caps in the United States. Uh, we tend to narrow down our companies on that, uh, on those parameters. And then the next thing we do is we look for their future compounding capabilities. And we do that by analyzing Warren Buffett's good old moats. Except we actually have our own proprietary process for moats, which I've got a scoring framework here that I can show you uh, how we think about good companies. And you can take this scoring system and you can do it with every single one of these stocks that you just went through um, and uh, basically be able to score and figure out uh, some of the attributes of these companies. But let's see here if I can share screen. Uh, this is our uh, moat process. It's called Club Blue Platform. Uh, and just maybe I can start off with Microsoft versus Verizon, but we're looking for companies that number one are a club. So they either dominate their markets that are in those markets are really tough ones for others to penetrate because they're so dominant. Uh, they're platform businesses, so they control a valuable network. I think, you know, in today's terms, we usually think of these as technology companies, but they can also be, have a distribution advantage like McDonald's. <laughs> uh, and then, um, you know, again, uh, then you have Glue, benefit from loyal and captive, captive customers are hard uh, companies to disrupt. Uh, we generally speaking like to look for companies that have at least two of these attributes. Um, and just to get back to Alan's commentary, the one that will let you know whether a business is most likely to compound or that you need to be very, very careful on price is the Glue. If the customer is cyclical, if the products are cyclical, if it has a weak new score, then you better be careful about what you pay. And the perfect example of that is Carnival Cruise Lines, which, uh, oh, sorry, I'll get to the next page, but, um, sorry. This is a word doc, let me back out of it. Sorry. Sorry, I was in a rush today. We had a we had an incredibly busy earnings season. But this is sort of how you think about clubs, leads, and platform businesses. It's a really, really quick cheat sheet. Um, you have clubs, they can be low-cost leaders. Sorry, I'm trying to go through the models in terms of who's a low-cost leader on your spreadsheet or on your company list. Um, you can have asset monopolists, uh, Disney, <laughs> Coca-Cola. Uh, McDonald's in some respects, Microsoft for sure. Uh, by the way, the reason Microsoft is outperformed, sorry, I'll get back on. Uh, Glue is, um, you can also have efficient scale players. I don't see any efficient scale players on your list, but an efficient scale player would be um, one that dominates like a really tiny little niche. It could be like a local bank that just has a dominant niche or, um, sorry, I'm trying to think of other US companies that maybe fit that bill. Um, in our world, it's drug stores, uh, or there's a soy in Japan. They're each very regionally dominant. There's no one big national player. And then also in, um, in uh, Hong Kong, there's a very dominant soy milk player. Just think of it as like the beyond meat of Hong Kong, it's super like big thematic play on 
um, healthier eating habits, but it's much cheaper than that stock with probably equivalently good growth potential. Um, in terms of blue, we are looking for uh, benefits from loyal or captive cu customers. So what forms can blue businesses take? Must have products. So Microsoft is a glue. Why is Microsoft a glue? Because I wouldn't be sharing this presentation with you right now. Every single one of our IT, you just think of our business suppliers and IT companies, et cetera. Sorry, all of us as businesses, we have to use Microsoft. We have no choice. So it has been a really stick, sticky business. You don't see a lot of cyclicality in the earnings because of that. They do have a couple of cyclical businesses in terms of their sort of legacy um, console businesses like Nintendo and their legacy um, hardware businesses. But by and large, their software is very sticky. I think you could probably say the same thing for Verizon, except I will give you why I think Verizon has underperformed. There are two reasons. Um, we go back and if you look at this club attribute in the telco space, the government is the club. <laughs> it's even though these are dominant players that you can get surprised by regulation and just blown up in the space technically. And then if I were go back to go back into our screening process, Verizon has a net debt balance sheet. Microsoft's balance sheet is better than any government's balance sheet in the world. It is a spectacular balance sheet, which gives them all kinds of flexibility to buy back their shares, increase dividend yields. That is another form of margin of safety, that balance sheet, that compounding capability, that moat that generates EVA over uh, time. Um, last but not least, um, we'll go to platform, which platform can take a lot of forms. A platform can take a logistics and distribution network, a scale advantage, so that could be McDonald's. Um, it can take the form of a communication or social network. I think those are obvious in the world. You know, that could be anything from Facebook, um, social networks to Google to Amazon uh, in terms of platform advantages. And then again, marketplaces is another platform advantage. So we take a scoring process. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I had to use Microsoft. So sorry, word that forces me to screen forward one page. So this is our scoring process. We take a nine point, a zero to three point scoring process and we score the club, the strength of the, the moat in terms of defensiveness of the monopoly or oligopoly or efficient scale. Uh, advantage, we score the glue. So how sticky is this product? Um, again, one of the reasons like Carnival has uh, less sticky customers is because by and large, I don't know if you guys know this, but most people finance their crews and most people are still paying off their first cruise when they take their next cruise. So outside of COVID, when the credit market contracts, that can really affect who is taking a carnival cruise Cruise uh, outside of just let's ignore COVID and just think about what is the CGP here uh, when, um, you know, when you don't have COVID. But again, it's a great club industry. There are only three players in the world. You know, Disney has a really tiny, tiny cruise arm, but it isn't big. Uh, and then last but not least, we score the platform as well. One thing I will point out to you back again in terms of Alan's cyclicality question and long-term compounding is outside of bad balance sheet or overvaluation, you still, still, still have to watch what you pay uh, for these businesses. You want to be careful. The number one factor that makes you have to be sensitive on price is blue. Um, going back to Nintendo and Disney example, uh, Disney outside of COVID is a three club, a three platform, and as you guys all know, because they bought 20th Century Fox two years ago, um, it is a much stickier business today because uh, that uh, that um, direct-to-consumer distribution platform uh, is just much less cyclical than the other two pieces of the business. I think they're at about 35% uh, operating capacity on the park side of the business. So it... It, technically, the glue is is improving because of that network uh, or direct to consumer business. So, uh, what was a lower glue rated business at one point in time has really increased. On Nintendo, 
Uh, I totally agree. It's a three, probably a three club, two to three club, and maybe a two to three platform business. Disney's fallacy and why it hasn't performed very well, and they're trying to fix this right now. I, sorry, Nintendo's. I've met Nintendo many, many times. It's a Japanese company. They're very conservative. Um, and one of the things that they do is they hide uh, their console is this golden profitability goose and they don't want to kill it. So one of the things that they have not done well is they have not monetized their IP. There's no reason that Nintendo should not be monetizing the heck out of, you know, Mario Brothers. I think you see the first attempt at them doing this right now with that new, I don't know if you guys see the new race tracking they're doing right now where you can buy Mario and uh, they're trying to monetize their IP better. So they're trying to create more products and goods around uh, their IP. And then in addition, they're also, I don't know if you guys know, but in terms of the video game industry in general, most of them are creating uh, subscription-based platforms right now, which has a sticky Netflix-like monthly fee. Uh, Nintendo has had records subscribers uh, on this platform. Uh, but it's really low fee right now, just like uh, Disney only charges, by the way, 20 bucks in India and um, Indonesia for, for Hulu Plus. And, and basically, Nintendo is doing the like, same thing on their um, gaming platform. So is Microsoft. I think Microsoft's is like 10 bucks a month. Apple's is like 10 bucks a month. And the whole goal of these companies is to try to mute the cyclicality of the product cycle so and to monetize their IP. They also, I don't know if you guys know this because of COVID-19 has shut down the theme park, but Nintendo uh, now has their own theme park in Japan within Universal Studios that is like a Super Mario themed uh, park. And that is an attempt to monetize their IP as well. So they've done a horrific job in the past of monetizing their IP and are really trying to take a step forward because it would increase that blue score. Uh, that's about it. You can do this with any single company. If you have a weak blue score, be very, very careful about chasing momentum. Uh, you still have to get the balance sheet right. Verizon has a weaker balance sheet. And again, the company might be, the government might be a regulator. They might be the club. So that might disrupt Verizon. Um, so you can, and again, uh, Southwest Airlines has weaker blue and having been experienced through Abercrombie and Fitch in the 90s, apparel, fast fashion, big box apparel is very, very cyclical, weak blue. That's about it. But you can use this on any single company. It's really simple. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that with us, Laura. Um, I want to open it up. If anyone has any questions for Laura, you can either type in the chat or um, unmute yourself. I do have a question, but I don't know, because so, uh, right now I've been looking at, you know, I've been trying to research some stocks that I could possibly like invest in. And something I've had, I've had a difficulty finding is how do you find like a moat and small stocks before they have gotten the time to like flourish? It's you know? easier in international. It's really hard in big economies. It's really hard because the U.S. is such a big, big economy that, you know, the small by the time good businesses tend to go up the cap spectrum because again it's a big economy lots of you know total uh, you guys all use tam i don't but um you know there's a huge total addressable market so that means they tend to get big if they're good companies if they're motive they're good the only way you can do that in the u.s really is to focus on those efficient scale players that i was talking about so maybe like a regional monopoly uh something funky like a uh this one stands out to me, but you know, you have some of the like regional convenience stores, stuff like that. Not super exciting businesses, but they do have a moat. Um, and if you time them right, but it's hard, it's much easier when you do international because uh, emerging and frontier economies are really small, they're nascent. Um, so you can find really, really good companies in the small cap space that have moats. Um, just to give you an example, New Zealand is a country that only has 3 million people. Uh, the eBay, the Amazon, it's, it's been taken out now, but the eBay, the Amazon, everything, the Yahoo, the Google, everything, Facebook of uh, New Zealand, because it was only 3 million people, was trading at less than a billion market cap. So 
Um, that's easier. China's hard now because the economy's gotten really big. So down the cap spectrum gets really dangerous. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Laura, I have a question in the chat. Um, Eliana wants to know which specific companies do you think are the safest to invest in right now during COVID? Oh, wow. It's tough because it's so tough because you've had a really, really, really big flight to safety trade happen, right? You've got flight to e-commerce because everyone sort of shifted their purchasing habits to e-commerce. You have, um, sorry, you could, all these trades, you have a flight to healthcare. Healthcare in China is like through the roof because everyone's camped out there. Glove companies, they're camped out there. Clorox, Clorox, look at Clorox stock. It's like straight up, right? Because everyone's been buying disinfectant. The paradox of that might be, and I think you guys all saw this, right, last Monday and this Monday when the vaccine news came out, the safe stocks may not be very safe right now. So what may be better to buy is those weak blue stocks like Carnival that have a recovery story. Now that said, that said, the balance sheet there, you know, is still like they've had to take on a lot of debt like during this environment. So from our perspective, like it's a harder stock to buy. Um, some that we have, and even, um, sorry, the Disney of Japan has a net cap, they have a net cash balance sheet. It's the most visited Disney on the planet. It's called Oriental Land. It is, um, they, I, they literally have 10 years of cash on their balance sheet. So the world could shut down for like 10 more years and that stock is, they'll survive. Um, but the problem is because of that, the stock has done really, really well because people are like, well, it's fine if we have a worsening COVID landscape and it's fine if consumers come back. So we would tell you it's one of the most difficult environments I've ever seen, maybe since 99, because what is safe is expensive. And the COVID recovery stocks, we all saw, that was a 15 standard deviation event, what happened last Monday when Pfizer made that announcement in terms of momentum's underperformance. So it's tough, it's really tough and I don't have a perfect answer. So our answer on our strategies has been barbell it like mad. Own some COVID safety stocks, you know, the healthcare, the e-commerce with good balance sheets. Microsoft is another one. Um, and then, you know, own the recovery stocks. So just barbell, which it sounds like most of you guys are all doing anyway, so. Awesome. Does anyone else have a question? I have a question. It kind of flows into what we were talking about. So with stocks like American Airlines and how we were talking about Carnival Cruises, uh, I noticed like whenever there's recession periods, they always drop dramatically, but they always increase. But that increase usually has a cap. So do you recommend investing and just taking out the money sometime, with, sometime in there? Or should we just kind of stay away from it and try to really go into value stocks? Well, what's so hard is back to the COVID on, COVID off sort of trade, or let's call it risk on, risk off. But what's been traditionally risky in a recession this time is not necessarily, uh, you know, what's been so contrary to popular belief, e-commerce stocks actually are consumer discretionary stocks. So the stuff that people purchase on an e-commerce platform may be cyclical. Why Amazon and why, sorry, I'm getting off on a tangent, but why Amazon and why Walmart all want to do grocery is because grocery is not cyclical and grocery is in terms of the consumer's wallet in the US, it's about four times the size of what Amazon and Walmart have traditionally catered to in terms of just consumer wallet. I mean, food is a big ticket item. It tends to be really um, counter cyclical because I don't know they call them SNAP now, but it used to be called food stamps. But you can use that online now. And that also tends to be very, uh, the glue tends to be really sticky because when you get a contraction in the economy, that's revenue that you don't lose. Long story short, sorry about that. I've gotten off the tangent from Carnival. I mean, I think COVID took us all by surprise, right? I mean, who would have thought that the demand would have you know, contracted like that? We were in a pretty good cycle. So my assessment is that probably right now, since it is very weak flu uh, in terms of cyclicality, you probably have a pretty good recovery story there. But if there's any sort of fear of COVID going up again, multiple years of no cruises, 
then it just doesn't have a great balance sheet. And, you know, it's really sad because if you look at the founder of that company, who has been around for years and years and years and his actual holding in the business, I mean, for all, you know, everyone thought he was, that was the better balance sheet in space. So, I mean, in terms of like ranking, you've got the best balance sheet company. The problem though, that I see is the industry is so consolidated now that when you, I don't know if you guys noticed, but in the past, when the cruise lines would have a bad cycle, they just sold ships to, they could sell ships to the better balance sheet. No one has a balance sheet that can do that right now. So that's a really tricky landscape. So my commentary for you is maybe it's not your best long run stock if it, if it bounces a lot. I've made the same mistake. So, you know, on a club and platform basis, it's exceptionally good. The balance sheet is just iffy. Their assets are very good, but it's very, very cyclical. And the stocks did that back in the, sorry, going back in time, thinking about why the, that you had some of these cycles. Some of them, if you go back in time and look at the charts, that's probably 9-11 in the charts. So, um, just kind of look back at that 01, 02 period, and that's a pretty good parallel uh, for what could happen. Thank you so much. No, thank you. I was shocked. Your presentation was fantastic. Sorry, I don't mean to be shocked by that, but it's better than ours. <laughs> Does anyone have uh, anything else for Laura uh, today? Laura, this is James. Um, oh. I couldn't resist. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know you. I couldn't on. resist hearing Laura Garrett's talk about what makes a great business. So <laughs> I had to. Uh, I had to dial in. <laughs> How are you, well, Laura? I'm great. How are you? What, what do you think of here? these? What, I mean, what do you do here? In these markets, ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been. Like you said, it's been killer, this rotation out of quality into cyclicality. Um, you know, you see, what do we do? We stick to what we do, right? We, we, we own quality businesses and we are not gonna outperform in every, every environment, but we're gonna yeah. stick, to, stick to what we do. I think there's good secular growth um, trends. And so there's lots of good secular growth opportunities opening up but it's it's tough yeah we've been we've been hit hard as well on relative performance are you I have a question I have a question for you Laura um because this is your time to be on the spot um how do you think about valuation in today's world so um you know on one hand um on one hand companies are expensive, um, especially on an earnings basis. But on the other hand, when you look at um, low interest rates and implied discount rates and low inflation, staying low potentially for longer, valuations could continue to just rise and rise and rise. And so um, how I do you agree. think about valuation? <laughs> the stronger the CGP, the stronger the CGP and the more, I mean, the more the interest rates are Japanifying. Uh, yeah. As you guys probably know, I, I lived in Japan off and on all my life. So I'm a student of deflation, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> Either fortunately or unfortunately, I have the sort of deflationary playbook uh, from Japan, maybe now Europe. But for sure, I mean, if you think about it on a Warren Buffett basis. I mean, Warren Buffett said it better than anyone. He hasn't followed the playbook as well as like his own, what he says about, you know, in a 1% interest rate environment, a company can sustain a hundred PE, you know, for if it with growth, if it grows, you know, the inverse of the, you know, the earnings yield, you know, is still 1%. And if it grows, you know, next year it'll be higher than 1% and the next year. So, I mean, that has definitely been playing out in Japan, right? I mean, we see the higher the secular growth, the better the club and the glue and the platform, um, then the more that you're seeing stocks actually go to those 100 PE levels. And in my opinion, you're, you're an emerging markets person, so am I. I see no inflation in the emerging world other than just supply chain disruption. It's, it's deflationary or it, disinflationary at, at most. So I think interest rates 
in emerging are headed straight down to US levels. I think the US has boxed itself in. It is now Japan. So yeah, it's, stocks are way better than bonds, in my opinion. They're going to be volatile, volatile, but you know, on an earnings yield basis, then you know, as long as interest rates keep coming down, I view the you know the price that you pay is somewhat of a bond proxy or spread to bonds. And bonds are terrible. Look, bonds look terrible to me here. So um, that's yeah. I think it's really challenging though because the more and more you're like digging into your models, the more you're having to justify returns with a higher PE, which. For me, you know, that's shocking on an absolute basis since I've seen multiple so low, but it makes all the sense to me in the world given bond rates in the average bond rate around the yeah. world, including emerging, is one percent right now. With developed Crazy. markets, I don't Nestle India or Nestle Switzerland all day long. You have a negative one percent bond yield there, and the Swiss currency is rock solid. So Sorry, that was a long-winded answer, but it is yeah. really complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. I think you're right. I mean, it's all relative, and stocks still look, on a yield basis, more attractive than bonds. But it's it gets hard as a portfolio manager to put a 30 times earnings, 40 times, 50 <laughs> times as a target price, and you know, keep pushing yourself up. <laughs> I mean, some of the emerging markets, at least you could argue there's been, six, you know, uh, there's no middle, uh, there's no middle class consumption right now, except in China, by and large, right? Yeah. So maybe yeah. some of our, I find myself justifying like, well, if you ever get a mass consumption recovery again, then my earnings are on trough levels. But I mean, that's even that gets harder and harder to justify but as we both know like when you look at india and the you know the car market penetration is like 20 cars per a thousand people yeah. in india versus like 800 cars per thousand people in the u.s the long run growth story is great but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's hard it's hard so yeah and all of our best performing stocks in the last few years anyway have been the ones with the eye-popping multiples so yeah exactly exactly <laughs> if if the company's delivering the market will pay what it needs to pay um yep. yeah all right well thanks laura and well, thanks thank for doing you. this you're you you're amazing no thank you so much what you've created is spectacular i love watching these young people uh, this is, be passionate. Well, thank you so much for what you've done christine you too yeah, thank thanks you, so much, Laura. Um, I can't thank you enough for being here today, Laura. I want you to leave us with one piece of advice if you can. So if you could give yourself in high school one piece oh. of advice, what would it be? Oh, um, yeah, you know, just read, 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 read. I mean, because because I think curiosity and reading are the two like biggest attributes that you need in the industry. You don't have to be a math superstar, you know, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room, but just follow your curiosity and follow your passion. And I think you'll be successful in this business. Excellent. Fun. I think you can tell from James, he's extraordinarily passionate. I love every minute of my job, even when I'm lagging on a, you know, melt up, but <laughs> um, I love it. So I highly recommend it as a career. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Laura. I can't thank you enough for being here today. It was great to see you. James, thanks for joining us today. What a great surprise. <laughs> um, well, that's it for this week. So I will see you guys in two weeks. We're taking a little vacation for uh, the holiday, but we'll be back again. Um, so I'll see you guys all very soon. Thank you. Bye, Bye guys. Thanks, Laura. Thank Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.